So in 2 Samuel chapter 6, there's a couple things I just want to touch on tonight. Of course, the real familiar passage. Uh, everyone's probably heard this story at some point. Uh, the real famous passage about, uh, you know, bringing the ark back and Uzzah being killed uh, for having touched it. And, you, you know, you might read that the first time. You might hear that story and think, boy, that seems kind of harsh. But, you know, God specifically told the children of Israel that they weren't even to look in the ark. You know, and that there was a very specific group of people that were to do, uh, you know, the duties pertaining to the ark, those that were supposed to transport it. He was very specific in how he wanted things done. You know, we talked about that last week, uh, about how God wants things done a certain way and how it's important that we don't just make up our own ideas about how we're going to do things when it comes to the house of God. And I just want to look at that again real quick, is, you know, David's error when it came to the ark. There's really, you know, a couple things that he does wrong here in the story. And the first thing is, is that he uses the wrong guys. You know, he gets the wrong guys. It says there, again, David gathered all, uh, together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him before Bailey of Judah. And jump down to the end of verse 3 there. And it says, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. Of course, that's where he put the ark. We just read that. But it's these two sons of Abinadab, uh, Uzzah and Ahio, that end up doing, you know, handling the cart. And these guys are not Levites. These guys aren't priests. These are guys that just, you know, he picked out. Now, some people will try to say that, yeah, that these, that that you know, the sons of Abinadab, Abinadab, you know, was was sanctified. And but he, there's no evidence. You know, he was anointed at one point, but there's no evidence in Scripture that says that he was a Levite. You know, some people try to make that conclusion. I just don't see it in Scripture. I don't see where these guys are Levites. In fact, if you want to go over to uh, First Chronicles with me, First Chronicles chapter number fifteen, you know that was the David acknowledges that was the exact problem that he had, that he got the wrong guys to do this job to begin with. He he himself even you know acknowledges that. So to sit there and say, well, you know, he's these were Levites. It was just that they did it wrong. You know, that, it's actually two things that went wrong here. One, he got the wrong guys to do it. It was supposed to be the Levites, and then, you know, he did it the wrong way. And it says there in uh, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, I don't want to read all of this. <clears throat> Go to uh, verse 11. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar, the priests for the Levites, for Uriel and Asiah and Joel and uh, Shemamiah, and Eliel, and Aminadab, not Abinadab, which we just read about, but Aminadab. And he said to them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord of, the Lord, uh, of, the Lord of God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord God, our God made a breach upon us. So this is, you know, a parallel passage where he's, saying, where he's going back to get it the second time. And bring it back. And now he's saying, well, let's get the Levites. Let's get these specific priests to do it. And he's saying there, you know, uh, he said in verse 13, For because ye did it not at the first, which is what we're reading about tonight, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. Saying, why did Uzzah die? Why did he have the breach upon Uzzah? Because the wrong guy was doing it. Because the Levites weren't involved. Okay? And, you know, what we can learn from this is that, you know, qualifications matter. You know, people need to be qualified for certain jobs, all right? You know, even the world understands this. You know, you can't just walk into any old job without certain qualifications. You know, of course, there are jobs out there where the only thing you need is a pulse, you know, but those typically aren't, you know, the high-paying jobs. Those aren't the jobs that, you know, have specialty uh, skills required. You know, there are a lot of jobs in the world where if you don't have the proper training, you know, if you don't have the proper education, if you don't have the experience, you know, you're what? Unqualified, okay? So that's one way to look at it. But, you know, more specifically here, when it comes to serving God, qualifications matter. Qualifications matter. Go over to, uh, you know, the very familiar passages. We all know these, but uh, just go over to uh, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter number 1. You know, there are qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 that tell us, you know, that there are certain qualifications for what? For the bishops and the deacons. You know, not just anybody can get up and just, you know, be the preacher, be the pastor, be the deacon. You know, there has to be qualifications that are met. And I, I don't want to take the time to go through all those tonight. Okay, you, you know, we probably are very familiar with those. Other passages, you know, other sermons have been preached about that. But this is, you know, I'm going to bring it up because this is something that we see taking place today. You know, I, I've seen a lot of, I've heard of, of, of multiple people who just one day decide that they want to be a pastor and, and, you know, do they go serve in a local church? 
Are they approved by the, by the body? Does somebody, you know, does an ordained minister lay their hands upon them and anoint, and, and, you know, and, and bless them and appoint them to that office? No, they just appoint themselves to that. They're self-appointed, okay? And look, being, a self, being self-appointing yourself to the pastorate is unbiblical. It's unbiblical. You know, we see example after example when men are put into positions of leadership over God's people that somebody else appoints them to that position. Okay? Somebody else takes them and puts them in that position. It says in Numbers, I'll just read to you, when Moses was handing over the, the, the mantle to Joshua to take over in his stead, it said in verse 18, Take uh, the Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, right? And set him uh, before Eli- Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. What is this? This is an ordination. Now, this is him saying, look, this is who I'm appointing to this position. I'm doing it in the sight of everybody. I'm doing it in front of the priest. You know, no one here is objecting. He's being appointed this position with a literal laying on of his hands, you know, which is just symbolic. It's not like it's some kind of, you know, mystical thing taking place. It's just, you know, it's, it's a way of showing people that this person has been appointed to this position by who? By himself? No, by another man of God, by somebody else who has deemed that individual qualified to fulfill that role. You know, and this is something that, uh, you know, is very basic. Is that a very complicated subject? I mean, we just saw an example of it. We're going to read about it here in Titus. I don't think it, I don't see anybody, you know, out there, you know, with a confused look on their face, wondering, you know, looking at it, going, what? You know, I don't get it, you know, trying to figure it out. This is real simple, isn't it? That in order to be ordained a uh, minister, you know, somebody else has to appoint you. And, you know, that's why Hebrews even says that this is, you know, a principal doctrine. This is a foundational, it's simple, it's a fundamental doctrine. He said in Hebrews 6, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptisms and of laying on of hands. What's he talking about? About ordaining. That's what laying on of hands is. It's ordaining somebody. And of the resurrection of dead and of eternal judgment. He says these are the principal doctrines of Christ. These are the simple things. Things like, you know, salvation, you know, repentance from dead works. He's talking about, I mean, salvation is a very elementary topic, isn't it? Of course, there's a lot of great deep truths in that. But as far as what it takes to understand the gospel, it's very simple. It's a very simple understanding that's needed. You know, faith toward God, baptisms. Is is baptism a real deep, complicated doctrine? There might be a lot of deep symbolism. There might be a lot of, you know, things we could draw from that, but as far as just understanding what baptism is and what it isn't, you know, that's pretty cut and dry, no pun intended, right? That's just, you know, you go under, it's a, it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You thought that was funny, didn't you? <laughs> that was really not intended. But it's, it's really that simple, isn't it? That's how simple laying on of hands is, too. That's why he calls it a principal doctrine. Well, how do you get into the ministry? Well, you know, somebody has to approve you, the local body approves you, the pastor approves you, you know, and it's not like the local body votes and says we do or don't approve. But before, you know, the pastor go and ordain somebody in a, into a role, like the, like, like the evangelist, you know, or what a lot of people call a missionary, or the deacon, or the pastor. Before he does that, you know, he'd probably ask around. He'd ask people in the church, people that he's close to, that person's friends. And he would get, you know, if he, see if, there's, if he has, what, a good report of them which are without and within, too. You know, if, there's, if you have a bad report within, you know, chances are you have a bad report without. But he would make sure there's no issues with that person, right? He would, he'd be somebody that is what approved of the congregation, you know, and then he would put his hands upon him and say, then I also approve of him and appoint him to this position. You know, that was the problem that, that, that David had here. You know, he just appointed whoever he wanted to do the work of God. And did things go well? No, they didn't. You know, if somebody died, you know, now I'm not saying that if you go to a church where there's a self-ordained pastor that somebody's going to die, well, you know what? It's not what God wants. It's not how God does things. And <clears throat> here's the thing. People will say, well, what, what should I do? You know, I go to, I live in a town where there's not a lot of options for churches. The only church I have, the guy is self-ordained. Well, you, you know, and this is just a matter of opinion, okay? But my opinion is this. Beggars can't be choosers. Beggars can't be choosers. You know, and unless you're willing to make some sacrifices and make some big moves in your life, beggars can't be choosers. You know, now me, what I would do if I if I was living in a town where I only had one 
you know, one good, you know, good church to go to. There was just one option. And I found out the guy was disqualified. You know, the pastor was never qualified or disqualified or he's self-ordained. I'd either just shut up and go to that church and try to be a blessing or I'd pick up, I'd pull up stakes and move, which is exactly what I did. Now, that wasn't the case where I was at. You know, I did have an ordained pastor, but, you know, I decided, hey, I want to go to a place, you know, I'm going to go to the best church possible that I know of. I'll move my family, you know, but if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to make those kind of sacrifices, then you know what? You need to just, you know, just go there and be a blessing and just, you know, obviously somebody, even if it's an unqualified guy, let's say he's not self-ordained, but he's just unqualified. Obviously somebody looked at that individual and said, he, he's got enough merit that I'm going to go ahead and ordain him, okay? And look, this goes on a lot in Bible colleges. Let me just go ahead and burst the bubble, okay? Bible colleges send out guys that are biblically unqualified all the time. I know that they've sent out people that aren't even married. Look, that's a qualification for the pastorate, to be the husband of one wife, to be the husband, not, not engaged, you know, not dating, you know, not, not a pro, you know, looking for a prospect. You know, that means married with children. You know, that means years have gone by. There's been a length of time in marriage because if, what, if he does, he know not how to rule well his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? That's a major qualification. And I'm telling you right now, Bible colleges, they just look right over that. And they send out guys all the time, oh, you'll find a wife when you get there. Go pastor this church. It's so, look, I know people are desperate for churches. People need good pre- churches, but you can't just take God's word and just say, well, you know, we just, you know, it just, we know that's what it says, but God will understand. No, God won't understand. You know, I mean, David, is that what David could have said? Look, we just want to get the ark back. Is, was David's motives right? Were they good? Yeah, he wanted the ark of God. He wanted to serve God, but he went about doing things his own way. And did God approve of that? Well, you know, I, that's not how I said to do it, but I'll let you slide, David. No, he killed the guy for it. You know, Uzzah died as a result. Okay, it's, well, God takes, uh, takes it very seriously, you know, and we should too. And we should take the qualifications that God puts upon the office of a bishop or a deacon or what have you seriously and not just, you know, uh, and think that everybody that just gets up behind a pulpit and says, I'm a pastor now, is somehow legitimate because they're not. And there's a lot, you know, there's more out there. I've seen so many, I've probably forgotten about some of them about some of these guys that get up and just ordain themselves and just start a church, you know, and you say, well, what's the problem with that? You know, here's the problem with that is that you say, well, how do you get into the ministry? You know, how do you get ordained? Well, you serve in the local church to begin with. And that's the problem with guys who just want to self-ordain. They don't want to serve. I mean, I know one guy, he, he's, he's, he's ordained himself. He wouldn't start it. He just started some church in his living room. And I'm not against churches and starting houses, right? We know plenty of good churches that have done that. But he just starts his church. No one sends him out. He wasn't even in a church before he's a pastor. He hasn't even learned the ropes of, of serving in the local ministry, you know, what it takes to sacrifice and just and do things behind the scenes unnoticed. You know, you, how do you get into the pastorate? I don't know, start by scrubbing a toilet, you know? Because guess what? That's what you're going to be doing in the pastorate, you know? You're going to go ahead and scrub. You'll probably still be scrubbing toilets and running vacuums and everything else. And if you're not willing to do that as just a lay person, you know, you're not going to be willing to do that as, as a pastor, okay? So that's kind of why it's a big deal. You know, that's kind of why I'm taking a minute to park it on this point because, you know, when guys are just self-ordaining themselves and, and going into the ministry all willy-nilly, just, you know, I feel like I'll be a pastor today. Who's to say that they're not going to feel like being a pastor tomorrow? You know, but a guy that's, that's, that's put in the time, put in the effort, met the qualification, has, you know, invested in that, meeting those, sta- those qualifications, he's a lot less likely to just, you know, go off the rails. <clears throat> of course, it's no guarantee, but, you know, that's kind of why I'm taking a minute to go over it, because it is important. I mean, that's important to God. Look at, uh, you're in Titus chapter 1, right? I'll read to you from 1 Timothy 4, going back to this idea of laying on of hands, right? This is a biblical doctrine. He said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. You know, there was a prophecy given. There was a preaching service. There was a, there was a charge given in the sight of God with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. You know, Paul and the elders of that church, they approved him, okay, of, of, of him going into the ministry, okay? Titus is another guy right, that was put in the ministry. 
It says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, or Titus chapter 1, excuse me, Titus chapter 1, verse 5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. He's saying, I want you to appoint other elders as I appointed you. So Paul appointed him so that he could appoint others, meaning you can't just go appoint yourself. It's not, it's not a biblical practice. And I don't care if your motives are as pure as the wind-driven snow. You know, it, it's not biblical. Okay, this is, the, this is the biblical practice. Paul ordained Titus so that Titus could ordain others. It goes from one man of God to the next, okay? <clears throat> so we have a problem today with guys that self-ordain, or what about guys that disqual- they, they start out legit, they were ordained, uh, they, they, they met the qualifications, they were ordained uh, biblically, put into the pulpit, you know, served God for many years maybe even, maybe even decades have gone by faithfully serving God, but eventually at some point they disqualify themselves. You know, if they should have the integrity to step down. And by the way, most men of God, real genuine men of God who love the Lord and love, love the Bible will know when it's time to step down before anybody else does. Okay, let me just say that. But there are, there, that doesn't mean there aren't disqualified guys today that still stand up behind the pulpit week in and week out and preach God's word. And they're, they're biblically disqualified. First Timothy, or you're in Titus, go over, look at verse six. If any be blameless, you know, they didn't get, you know, if they get caught in some, you know, scandal, I'm not saying perfect, they get caught in some scandal, you know, some sin, you know, they find out they're stealing from the offering plate, they're gambling, they're on drugs, you know, or any number of just, you know, wicked sins, you know, just any, you know, they got to be blameless, okay? You do those type of things, if you're not found blameless after, it's not like you get ordained, and then it's just you have, well, I'm just a pastor now, I can just go ahead and I can just pull out the ordination card and just play the pastor card anytime I want. You know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, stop being a pastor for a few years, and then if I feel like it, I'll start up again. No, you got to go through that process again. you got to be found, what, blameless, okay? Well, let's say he's in the pulpit, you know, he's in the ministry, and then it comes out that, you know, he's not blameless, disqualified, should step down. Now, that's not a biggest problem, but, you know, here's one that is, the husband of one wife. You know, there's plenty of pastors out there that are divorced. They're on their second wife. You know what the Bible says? Disqualified. Doesn't mean husband of one wife at a time. Is that what God's saying? He can't be a polygamist? I mean, come on. Is that really how you're, that, you know, that's, that's a real cute way to read the Bible. It's, but it's wrong. Okay, it's a husband of one wife, meaning he's never been divorced. And that's a whole thing right there. We could talk about divorce, you know. <laughs> Having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. You know, when it's adult children, should not he shouldn't have you know just a mess of adult children that are going out and just living for the world living for the devil accused of riot un, and unruly and you look up you know riotous living the prodigal son went and spent his father's inheritance with what riotous living drinking running around carousing you know those are things that only adult children can do right <laughs> to, to have a right you know a, a, a licentious you know you know live a, a licentious and lascivious lifestyle to be live uh, in a you know in a riot and unruly, you know if a pastor has children that you know go wayward, disqualified. Okay, now it says having faithful children. So you know what if what if what if a pastor has a bunch of kids, but not every single one of them turns out perfect. You know I think that's kind of a gray area. You know what if what if you know a lot of you know the the, the kids turn out right, but you have one or look because that's a is that a possibility. To have a bunch of kids and not every single one of them just, you know, sticks by the stuff all the way through. Maybe, you know, one goes out and has a season, maybe one or two go out. and You know, that I think that's a possibility. You know, I have several children. It might be that, you know, I pray not that my children grow up and, you know, this, this we assume are going to live for the Lord and that's our prayer for them and that's probably what's going to happen. But, you know, what, what, what if one of them, I'm not going to name any names, I don't have anyone in mind, you know, what if one of them went wayward? We say, oh, you're disqualified now. Well, it says, I, but I, hey, but hey, but the qualification is to have faithful children, but I still have that. See, you've got to kind of use discernment when you read this. And people who are on a hair trigger to just find a way to disqualify the pastor, you know, to me, that's, that's carnal. You know, that makes me wonder what's really going on. Is it because you have you such, a, such integrity and such a love for the word of God, or is it just because 
he got some beef with the pastor or something. I don't know, right? It, but that's kind of a, a red flag to me when I see people who are on a hair trigger to get rid of the pastor or, or, or fire the pastor over something. You know, and, and this could be one way that people try and do that. You know, one of my kids, you know, goes, goes wayward as an adult, but the rest of them turn out great. Well, you know what? I've met this qualification. That's my opinion. Now, people can argue with me about that and be wrong. <laughs> but that's what, this is what, you know, this is what David did. This is the error that he made with the ark. He just appointed whoever he wanted to do God's work, and it didn't turn out well, did it? He did things with the wrong people, and not only that, but he did things the wrong way, right? He did things the wrong way. It says in verse 3, back in 2 Samuel 6, and they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Oh, it's a new one. At least we got a new one. You know, it wasn't the old cart that was been drugged behind, you know, through all the manure and everything that the mules have been carrying around it. You know, it's, it's not full of a bunch of hay and, and, and everything else that we've been using it for. We No, we took the time and we got a new one, Lord. God's not impressed with your new one, okay? And that, you know, that's, and we could apply this to churches today, right? Is that they have a lot of new ways of doing things, don't they? There's a lot of new uh, ways of, of serving God in the local churches. You know, a lot, of, a lot of these new evangelical churches, new evangelical churches that want to change the way that we've done things for, you know, millennia <laughs> and just start because they think it's new or better. You know, we want to get rid of the King James Bible. We want to get rid of the traditional music because this is new. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily make it better, and it doesn't necessarily mean that God approves of it either just because it's new. That's what they did. They set it on a new cart and brought it to the house of Abinadab, which was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. So they had a new way of doing things. This is not how they were supposed to do it. I should have had you keep something in 1 Chronicles, but I'll just read to you in, verse 15, in chapter 15, verse 14. It says, so the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of Israel, and excuse me, and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to the word of God. So was, was it Moses' idea that they were to bear it on their own shoulders, that the, these specific people were to bear the ark upon their own shoulders? Was it his idea? Or was it that he commanded it according to the word of God? Look, I don't, I'm not interested <clears throat> if something's new or even better or whatever you want to call it. I'm interested, is it biblical? Is it what the Bible teaches? Are we doing things the biblical way? That's what we should strive to do when it comes to any area of our life, but especially when it comes to serving God in the local church, the way the churches should be run, what it's about, what we do here. It should be, is it according as the, as, to the word of God, as God commanded? And not just try to find new ways of doing things. Okay, and that's what people are, are real guilty of today. They want to find new ways of doing things. You know, they want to, uh, you know, get rid of the old, get rid of the, the King James version, and get what an easier to read version. You know, they don't want to bear that arc of having to learn the these and thous, which are just so hard. You know, ye, your, thee, thou. I can barely pronounce it. And you know that has serious. And did you know those words are there for like thee, thou? And ye your mean two different things. He your is, is a group. The thou is singular. You know, one's plural, one's singular. That matters. But if you get rid of all of that and just say you, I don't know who if he, is, the, is, he, is the Bible talking to a group of people or an individual now. See how the these and thous are important? You know, and I'm not to mention all the other things that they want to change and, and change the text and the way it reads and take verses out and, and debate whether or not it should even be in there. They want, to change, they want to get rid of the, the King James Version and bring in some new easy-to-read version. And you know what? They, people might look at it and say, oh, this is better. It's really not. It's really not better. This is the standard by which all other Bibles are judged by in the English version, the English language. This is the one that even the world lifts up and says this is the greatest work of English literature ever made. This book has had more, no other book has even come close to having the profound impact that it's had on the world as the King James Bible doesn't even come close. And they want to say, oh, it's better. It's not even close to better. I remember the 400th year anniversary, uh, the 400 year anniversary of the King James Bible, even National Geographic did like a huge piece. National Geographic, not exactly, you know, your conservative right wing, you know, uh, publication, okay? It's a bunch of environmentalism and everything else. But even they, a publication like that, a group like that said, this is a literary masterpiece. And of course it is, because it's written by God. Anything that God wrote would be amazing, right? And that's why the King James Bible is 
the, the true and tried, the standard by which all others are measured. Okay, but people today, they want to get rid of this. They're tired of this, this on their shoulders. They're like, oh, this is so hard to read. We need something better. You know, let's get, let's get, a, let's get the Ohio version. You know, let's get us a version in here. God says no, disapproves. God, God does not approve of it. What about, you know, practices when it comes to preaching the gospel? You know, instead of going out into the, into the highways and hedges, you know, instead of trying to preach to every creature, like the Bible says, instead of following the, 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 the example of Paul that he preached publicly and from house to house and from door to door, instead of doing that, what the Bible actually teaches, let's just bring everybody here, have a seeker-sensitive service. Well, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out what kind of music people like. You know, we'll just change the lyrics or, you know, to some Bon Jovi or Metallica song and get a bunch of people in here. We'll just look like the world. We'll just act like the world. And we'll just bring the world in here. And then we'll preach them the gospel in the house of God. And then we'll just make sure every Sunday that every message is just a gospel message. Now, would that be easier than door-to-door soul winning? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. And if you haven't, you don't think so, you probably haven't done much soul winning. You know, you should come out on Saturday. You should come out on Sunday, especially this time of year. That's hard work to go out there. It, and anyone who's done it for any length of time knows it's hard. Part of the hard work is just to stay motivated to keep doing it, right? That's why I'm always bringing it up. Keep us motivated. Keep us motivated to go out there and do the hard work of soul winning. I'm having people say, not interested, not interested, not interested. Being out there in the heat, it's hard work. Would it be a lot easier if just every, like, all the people we want to preach the gospel to just showed up here and then one guy could just preach the gospel once and have an invitation? You know, logistically speaking, that would be much easier, wouldn't it? But is that what God ordained? Is that what God wants? No. God wants us to bear a part in the ministry. God wants to put a burden on us. God doesn't want it to be easy. Because, you know, like I preached a while back, easy come, easy go. Look, if we're easy, you take it for granted. But when you're putting in the sweat, when you're putting in the hard work, when you're learning the verses, when you're you know, getting over the fears and the hesitations, when you're the one that's putting in that hard work, you know what? It's much more rewarding for you. And God, you know, when God comes through and you see God work through his word, it's much more rewarding, right? <laughs> what about, you know, the, it's a lot easier if I just quit preaching hard sermons. You know, I'll be perfectly honest, that'd be a lot easier for me. If I didn't have to, like, oh, got to deal with some sin or I got to get up and preach some unpleasant topic. Because look, we have to preach some unpleasant, and we just got out of June, folks. We all know I had to preach on some unpleasant topics. Look, and that you can't ignore that. You have to preach on that. You know, it'd be a lot easier to say, well, I'm just never going to preach on alcohol again because there's probably people that drink. I'm just never going to preach on whatever sin. I'm not going to preach against the homos. I'm not going to preach against, you know, here's one that would be, you know, it's hard to preach on, divorce. Because there's so many people that are divorced. You think that's a pleasant, you think that's easy? No, it's hard. <laughs> Try it sometime confront people about their sin. But is that, is that what God wants, though? He said, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions. Show them their sins. That's what he told Isaiah, to, to shout it from the housetops, to say, hey, you're in sin. This is wrong. You shouldn't do that. And there's all kinds of topics like that. It would be a lot easier, right, for me and probably for you, you know, at least when you show up to church, if you don't have to worry about, you know, is he going to make me, is he going to make me sweat today? Is he going to get on my sin? You know, am I going to get all uncomfortable? Look, I've been on the receiving end of plenty of those sermons. I've gotten in there like, oh, is this done yet? You know, I want to just slither out the door and go get right with God. I've been in those services, right? It'd be a lot easier for everybody, you know, if we just said, well, we're just going to preach the gospel here. We're just going to do, uh, we're going to do a 40-day series on grace. This whole year, we're just going to preach on nothing but grace. You know, we're just going to have one service a week. We'll have two services if you want to sleep in, but it's the exact same service. I'm going to have a 10.30, and then I'm going to have like a 1.30. They're both the same service. I'm preaching the same message. Just whichever one's more comfortable for you to come to, you know. And we won't do, we'll do it. It will be a lot easier for everybody, you know, technically speaking. But is that what God wants? No, he said, you know, we need to meet together the more, not the less. We need to come together the more as we see the day approaching. And the preacher's job is to get up and to preach hard sermons. Not just do things the way he wants, but to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Because <clears throat> here, any, people would say, well, that's easier, isn't it? That's easier to not preach on like that. It'd be so much easier for everybody. You wouldn't have to, you know, uh, make, be, make yourself into the bad guy. People wouldn't have to feel uncomfortable or get angry or upset. 
you know, it would be so much easier for everybody involved, but is that really what's best? Is that really what's best? No, it's not. Because here's the thing. These, you know, new evangelical, these non-denom churches that preach like that don't want to touch certain subjects with a 10-foot pole that are going to avoid preaching on controversial or subjects that will make up people upset. You know what those churches are full of? Sin. They're full of sin. There's fornication, drunkenness, adultery. There's all kinds of sin going on in churches like that. They're dens of iniquity. And I don't care if they, how they can come in and they can get their lattes in the back lobby and they can sit there with a smile on their face and, and talk about their golf swing or whatever else they do and just have a, you know, a social club. But their lives are full of sin. Because if it's not being preached against, what motive do you have to get right? That's the truth. That's why we need preaching. That's why we need hard preaching. And you know what I found as a preacher is that people want hard preaching. Not everybody, but there's some people they want, they're like, I want to come to church and have you rip my face. Why? Because they actually care about the things of God. They actually care about living for the Lord. They actually care about, you know, hearing the preaching of the word of God because they want to get right. I mean, I know that's, I, I know lots of people like that. I mean, that's how it is for me. I love coming to church and being challenged and being to change and to, and to get right and to, to live for the Lord. Okay. It gives meaning to life. So it might be easier to just not preach on those subjects, but the way of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. So the, the real hard thing is to just let people live in, 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 in sin because if they're God's children, God's not just going to stand idly by and just let his children live in sin. You know, he's going to get out the, the, the holy paddle and go to town, right, on some, on some spiritual backsides, right, in people's lives. That's how God works. So, you know, why don't we just take care of that here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursday night. Why don't we just take care of that here as we preach through the Word of God? You know, it might be hard while we're here. You know, no chastening for the, for the moment is, is, is pleasant. But afterward, it what? Yieldeth the, fruit, uh, the, the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness by those that are exercised thereby. I know I'm messing that up, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> All right? Why don't we just take care of it here in the house of God and, and, and get it right out there? That's what David did wrong here, right? He did things that, he just said, well, I'm going to point whoever I want, and we're going to do it however we think is best. And God said, no, that's not how you're going to do it. You know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm kind of loading the truck a little bit tonight. How about this one? Here's another example of people who want to just do things their own. Life. You know, God has a model. God has laid things out. And then they say, well, no, I have a better idea. They, we, we're, we're smarter than God here. How about on the, you know, the idea of having two, uh, two incomes versus a work-at-home mother? Notice I didn't say stay-at-home mother. Okay, I said work at home mother, okay, because that's what it is. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not against that term, but I started to write that in my sermon. I'm like, wait a minute. If I just get up and say stay at home mom, that kind of sounds like lazy. Now, are there just stay at home moms? Yeah, there are, right? Stay at home, stay in bed till 11 a.m. moms, whatever. But, you know, if a mother is fulfilling her God given role as a wife and a mother, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And, you know, I don't feel like I have to make that case. You know, any, you know, the ladies, I see a lot of ladies' heads going, mm-hmm. They wish they could say it. They want, amen, right? I got you. I, I feel that, right? It's a lot of work. But is that what the world says? That's a good idea for you to stay at home, and uh, ladies, and raise your children and homeschool and, and, and do what the Bible says, be a keeper at home? That's what the Bible says. I will, therefore, that what younger women marry, guide the house, and give none occasion for the adversary to speak reproach, reproachfully, for some are turned aside already after Satan right? That was what Paul wrote. He said that the women, the younger women should marry, bear children, and guide the house. What's God's will, will for, for, young, for, for, for ladies? That's it. You just, you know, I just quoted it to you. Is that what the world says? Is that what even a lot of these new churches say? The new Cart Baptist Church, Pastor, you know, Uzza, Pastor Ohio, is that what he's going to say? No, he's going to say, oh, there's nothing wrong with having two uncles. I've been in Baptist churches where they tell me that. You should have more kids than you can afford. I'd have exactly none then, because I haven't afforded any of them. You know, I mean, if, when I got married and you know we're going to have kids, you'd have told me, well, you're going to have, you know, we're up to five at this point. I said, well, I can't afford that. You know, but that's what I've heard in Baptist churches. That's what they get this philosophy in their heads too. That's why I'm taking the time to preach about it, because it's not biblical, and it might be easier, you know, to send mom off to go put on a name tag and a hairnet and go work at, you know, behind some cashier as a cash writer, or maybe she's got some great paying job, you know, maybe, 
And it might be easier to have two incomes. You have a bigger house, more vehicles, more vacations, more nicer things. But, you know, but the kids are, you know, getting indoctrinated at the public school, you know, or, you know, the marriage is a wreck or, you know, you know, they, you know, adultery happens in the workplace. That's where a lot of adultery takes place is at the workplace, those relationships. And like, that's a whole other sermon. I'm just, you know, I got to move on. I'm, I'm way past where I need to be already. But, you know, that's a good example of people who what? They want to do things God's way. Or excuse me, they don't want to do things God's way. They have a better idea. They say, well, you know, I know the Levites are supposed to do it, but you know what? I got these 30,000 men. I got these chosen guys. I got the sons of Abinadab. I got this brand new cart. What's, up? What's the harm? We're bringing the ark back, right? I mean, of course God's going to honor that. Eh, wrong. God is very specific because God has a purpose behind all of it. What's the purpose in making sure that the Levites do it? Because he wants people that serve God, what? To bear a burden. It, you know, the Christian life isn't supposed to be easy. <clears throat> now, let's just move on here in the story. It says in verse 6, And when they came to uh, Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God, and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. So that's how the story ended when you decided to go ahead and do things your own way. But let's moving on, move on to another kind of a different topic here. Is this, uh, it says there in verse 9, And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, don't miss that, okay? Because there is another Obed-Edom that you read about shortly after, okay? And, but this is Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Okay, that's very important. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. God says it twice. Three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household, household. So what's the significance here? Go to 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. What's the significance of Obed-Edom? the Gittite. Why is God making sure that he puts that in there twice? Is it just to, you know, distinguish himself from the, the other Obed-Edoms of the Bible? Or, you know, because he could have said Obed-Edom, the son of, right? But he specifically says the Gittite. And I think there's a lesson here that we see. Uh, uh, you know, this, this backs up this doctrine that, you know, God is not a respecter of persons because a Gittite is a Philistine, okay? Not an Israelite, not a Hebrew, Right? These are the Gentile nations. This was some, a nation that God actually wanted to destroy, it, the Philistines. Okay? It says, in, uh, you're going to 2 Samuel 29, 21. I'll read you from 1 Samuel 17. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine of Gath. Right? This is David and Goliath. When David goes down to check on his brethren and the Philistine of Gath comes out, Goliath by name of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same word. So the Philistine of Gath was Goliath. He was the Philistine of Gath. And we read about this guy again, but notice what it calls him in 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of Jerogeum, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. The Gittite, right? So God, David takes this ark into Obed-Edom, the Gittite's house, and he's a Philistine. And God blesses him anyway. And God, he said, well, wait a minute. These aren't my chosen people. You know, this isn't, you know, they're not the seed of Abraham. I can't bless them. You know, they don't have the right, he doesn't, you know, obed Edom. I'm sorry, you don't have the right bloodline. Actually, the guy who had the right bloodline touched the ark and God killed him. But then when he puts, when he puts the, uh, the ark into, the, into a Philistine's house, God blesses him. And, I, you know, I've preached a whole sub, sub, uh, sermon on this called uh, The Blessing of Obed-Edom. And what I think the great, the lesson, and I'll just touch on it very quickly, is that you know, God is not a respecter of persons. And this is important to bring up because, you know, a lot of Baptists today, they have this, these, they, they hang on to this idea that, you know, God is just blessing the Jews today. You know, even though Tel Aviv is the homo capital of the world, right? Even though they're at war and bombing, you know, one another over there and everything else that's going on. It sounds like, oh, they're really blessed, aren't they? You know who's blessing you know, the nation of Israel? It's called the United States. When you're sending $8 billion of foreign aid to them every year, that's called the blessing of man, not God. Okay? But, you know, Baptists today, and this is kind of a big can of worms to open up here, you know, with so short a time, but this is a principle, I think, that we see here in, in 2 Samuel. 
is that God is not a respecter of persons. And you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of scripture in the New Testament that talks about this. Go read Romans 2, go read Romans 11, you know, go read Galatians, go, go read practically any page in the New Testament. And the Bible talks about this. How that God has replaced the nation of Israel with the local church. Okay, or you know, it says specifically in Romans chapter 2 that you know he is a Jew which is one inwardly, right? And circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. He says he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, who's, you know, uh, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew, which is one inwardly. You know, the real Jew today is me and you. We're the true Jews. We're, the, we're, we're God's people. That's what it says. <clears throat> it says in Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seeds. Who, who's Abraham's seed today? Is it a bunch of Christ-rejecting Jews over there in the Middle East who spit every time they say, hear the name Jesus, who believe that Jesus is boiling in his own excrement in hell? That's what they believe. That's what's written in the Talmud, folks. You know, and I'm going to say that because people need to wake up to this idea that these people hate God, they hate Christ, so don't tell me that God's blessing them. And that God is somehow just going to look over all of that blasphemy that they believe just because, you know, they claim to be the descendants of Abraham. They're not. How could anyone even know that? You know, they're, they're, they're Polish is what they are. They're Ashkenazis, you know, if you know the history behind it. You know what, you know what the real the irony is? Is that the Palestinians there, if there's anybody there that has any kind of, you know, that could have any kind of genetic link to, the, to Old Testament Israel, it's the Palestinians. They probably have more genetic uh, similarities to them than the, the so-called Israelites that are living there today. That's a real irony, isn't it? But the point is this, you know, neither of them can prove that, but I'm just supposed to believe that that's God's chosen people over the day, blasphemy in Christ, that godless nation over there. And then the Bible is just specifically telling us that we're the children, that what? That if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. That's me and you. We're Abraham's seed. I am the Jew today because I'm one inwardly. I'm God's chosen people. I'm the election. I've obtained the salvation by grace. Through, you know, I, I'm, I am the election. Not those people over there. And I, 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 that's what I see when I read that in 2 Samuel, is that God is not a respecter of persons. That if people will receive him, like even like Obed and Edom, the Gittite, who when they, when they came to say, hey, we need to put the ark here in your house. I mean, he's a Philistine. He knew a couple things about what happens when the ark shows up around the Philistines. People get emeralds in their, in their secret places. <laughs> you know, that's in there. First Samuel. Mice show up. There's plagues. You know, he just said, uh-uh, no way. I don't want that here. He said, you know what? Go ahead. Do what you need to do. And God blessed him for that because God is not a respecter of persons. And I don't care who you are. If you receive Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Then are you the children of God. Then God blesses you, okay? And I got a, I know that's a big topic to open up and then just move along. But, you know, I had a lot of scripture, but I was going off on other things earlier. Let's just move along. Because I do want to touch on this. I think this is really, um, you know, there's been whole sermons and there will be plenty more to come on those subjects. But, you know, it's not very often you get to talk about this. I want to talk about Michael, uh, Michael and David here at the end, right? And this shows us that, you know, not every man of God in the Bible had this picture perf perfect marriage. You know, this is a very strained relationship, okay? But let's just pick it up there in verse 12. It says, And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth to him because of the ark of God, not because of his lineage, but because he received God. I'm going off again. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bear the ark of the Lord... They that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six spaces. He sacrificed oxen and flatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was, was girded with the linen ephod. Now remember, we're going about to read this where Michal says, you know, you uncovered yourself as one of the vain fellows, right? It's not saying he was naked, okay? It's not saying that. Because one, we just say he was girded with a linen ephod. So he's wearing clothing here, okay? It's just what I believe she's referring to the fact is that he kind of made of him, he, he, you know, he put aside his, 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 his kingly garments. You know, he made himself more like a commoner or something like that. I don't think, it, you know, it's open for interpretation exactly what is meant by that. And remember, this is Michael speaking, who I believe at this point in the story is an envious woman. It was really just using her words to, to hurt David. 
right? We'll get to that. But don't get, don't read that and think, oh, David uncovered himself, meaning he was, you know, running around half naked or something. I don't believe that's what it was saying. It says, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the, uh, the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, who was his first wife, if you know the story, that was who David married. Okay? This is his legitimate wife. This isn't one of the many wives he took afterwards. Okay? And remember, at this point in the story, he's already begun, he has a multitude of wives, and he's begun to, to, to multiply not only wives, but also concubines. This is where David's at in the story. Okay? And Michal looked through her window and saw King David leaping and dancing with the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Now, here's the thing. You got to kind of understand, you know, how people are, okay? You got to understand something about human nature. I don't think that Michal was just perfectly satisfied in her marriage with David. Everything was just great, and then she just sees him leaping and dancing before the Lord, and all of a sudden she despises him in her heart, okay? I think what's, this is, you know, David's actions, you know, provoked her at this point. This is, this, this has been, a, my opinion is this, is that, She's probably at this point has a simmering resentment of David that's just kind of been there. And now it's finally kind of, it's, it's you know, boiling over at this point. Because you're going to sit here and tell me, I mean, that everything was great up until now. Every, just the perfect marriage until now. You know, remember before, you know, when she, she uh, you know, when, when David has to flee, you know, she's lying to her father to save David's life. He's gone for years, doesn't see him, gets married off to another man. We read about that a couple weeks ago, right? He gets, she gets married off. Then David comes back and says, you know what? Come on home, honey. Doesn't say she was glad to do it, right? We don't really know what her reaction was. You know, Faltiel, I believe it was, he was, he was pretty upset by it. You know, it wasn't like, you know, oh, you know, good riddance, you know. And maybe she felt the same way. We really don't know. But I have, what I'm getting at is this, is that she's not just thinking, I have a hard time believing that, this is a great marriage, great relationship, and then this just this is just too much. There's been a lot of things that have gone on in this relationship that are not good, right? And this is just, you know, her resentment coming out, right? Because David's offended her previously. I mean, he's, like I just said, multiplying wives. He's got concubines. Look, that women are, you know, uh, very envious, and rightfully so, you know, of who their husbands give their attention to. Right when you when you take that vow of saying you know un, you know uh, you know keep I will keep myself only unto thee they take that seriously and we all should right that's what's meant by that so when David you know is having a multiple wives and concubines you're gonna tell me that that wouldn't get under her skin I mean ask yourselves that ladies wouldn't that bother you you know you know your husband puts the the pinup poster out in the garage that should bother you. You know, that would, that you say, so, well, you're, you're such a prude. No, that she's right to be upset by that kind of thing. And you know what? My call in this story, maybe she doesn't do it right, but can you really blame her for her actions? You know, maybe she's not, everything she's not 100%, but let's be honest, David's not exactly squeaky clean here in this situation either. <clears throat> and what the, we can learn from this, and I just want to make this application, is that, you know, envy is a very powerful emotion. Envy is a very powerful emotion. And we should be very careful, especially in the relationship of husband and wife, not to harbor or instill that. You know, we don't want to hang on to envy, especially if it's unwarranted. You know, you kind of, but we also, as you know, we don't want to instill that in our spouses either. Make them envious of the fact that maybe somebody else is getting our attention. Maybe it's not even a person. Maybe it's not even a relationship. Maybe it's a job or something like that. You know, or maybe it's, you know, the kids get all the time now and the husband doesn't get any time or the, the job gets all the time and the wife doesn't. It could be any number of things. There's a lot of things that people could get envious about in that relationship. We just need to be careful not to provoke that. But, you know, especially when it comes to a late relationship like what was going on with David, where he has, he's giving his time and affection to other women than his actual wife, right? And, you know, people, this is what just always boggles my mind is that when, I've known people that have gotten into an adulterous relationship, and then they're shocked that the offended spouse, you know, who was cheated on, you know, who, whose spouse had committed adultery, you know, that they're, they're shocked that, oh, their spouse is upset with me, that I, you know, committed adultery with their spouse. Yeah, are, are, really? That really, that's, that's, that's like a news to you? Like, and the Bible says wrath is cruel, 
and anger is outrageous. Look, wrath and anger are bad enough, right? You ever just make somebody really mad at you? You know, sometimes it's hard to put that fire out, isn't it? When you get someone really mad, or if you're the one that's really mad, sometimes it, it takes a lot of work to calm down and to not lash out, right? And to, but the Bible says that wrath is cruel, anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? You know, it's saying what? Cruel, it, wrath is bad, anger is bad, but envy, you don't have a chance when it comes to envy. And look, if we instill envy in our spouses, you know what? We shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise us when it comes back around on us. And when they finally lash out and that relationship goes sour, it, we really shouldn't be shocked by that. That's why we should work hard not to instill envy in our spouses. And, you know, that's why people who, you know, are the, the source of envy should not be so, so shocked when, when the offended party lashes out against them. You know, and there, I've heard stories, you know, the husband walks in, comes home early from work, and there's adultery taking place in the house with his wife. Next thing you know, the adulterer, the guy that's there, you know, uh, committing adultery with his wife is flying through a plate glass window out in the front yard. I mean, there used to be in some places, I don't think it was ever law here, but I think in France where it was called a crime of passion. Where if you caught adultery, you know, some, if you walked home, came home and you found uh, that your wife was committing adultery on you in the act and you killed that man in, the, in a fit of rage, they would let you go. Because it's understandable. Because, well, what do you expect to happen? It's his wife. You know, and people should not be shocked when that kind of thing happens. When the offended party shows up on your doorstep, you know, with a, with a 12 gauge or whatever, you know, that's, that's what the Bible's warning us about here, folks. That's what it's saying in Proverbs. Wrath is cruel. That's bad. It's bad enough. Anger is outrageous. But against, but before, who is able to stand what? Before envy. And that's what David was learning here, is that when you're, when you're, you know, instilling envy, feelings of envy in your wife, you know, and, and messing with her life, you know, and don't be, you know, don't be surprised when she lashes out on you and boils over. And then, you know, there's other pas passages we go to, but I'm, I got to, I got to wrap, wrap this up. Okay. It's getting late, but go to verse 20 because David, you know, David responds in a bad way too, because again, Michael, her, her reaction, her statement here, while inaccurate, maybe, you know, it wasn't that David was doing a bad thing. I think it was just that it was coming from a place of resentment. You know, David doesn't help the situation at all. And that's what we should learn when it comes to, you know, if you want to have a good marriage, is that you shouldn't try to outdo one another in verbal sparring. You know, there's a time to just be at peace with one another, okay? And just suffer the wrong, even, maybe. The Bible says, and uh, look there at verse 20, Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, and I want to jump down, look at tw verse 21, and just back up a little bit and notice how that last word ends. It's with an exclamation mark, okay? So she's going out and she's saying this very emphatically to him, right? And I believe, you know, when I read this, you could just, I, I, I could, I just feel that there's a very thick layer of sarcasm here when it comes from my call. She says, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself in the eyes of the handmaids of a servant. You could see that envy again, right? It's the handmaids that were there. That's what, you know, she, he's doing this in front of the, these young women, as of one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncover himself. So what she wasn't, you know, it sounds like, oh, how glorious you were. It's actually coming from a place of envy. It's full of sarcasm. It's a very cutting remark that she's making here. And she's trying to, you know, really get to David. <clears throat> and, you know, that's really what gets to men, you know, husbands more than anything. It's not what wives do. It's what they say, isn't it? Words are very powerful things. And, you know, that's the thing that wives have that power when it comes to these relationships. They know exactly what to say to really get to their husband, don't they? Because they, you know, husbands and wives, they know each other. They know everybody. They know one another's weaknesses and faults and secrets. They know all those little things. And, they, and if they want to, if they want to use their words like fists, they can. And that's what she's doing here. She's really digging into him. And David, you know, rather than trying to, well, what's wrong, honey? I'm sorry. Where is this coming from? You know, what is there something? Is it, what did I do? Try, rather than trying to rectify the situation and restore that relationship, he just fires right back. He uses his words. And David said to Michal, verse 21, it was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father. <laughs> right? You know, 
he's, he's just like, oh yeah, this is before that, you know, he chose me before thy father. You know, I'm better than your dad. You know, he, he's really just letting her back, have it back, right back at her. And before all his house, none of your relatives, God didn't choose your father. He didn't choose any of your relatives. He chose me, honey. Get used to it, sweetheart. This is who God chose, not your dad, not your cousin, not your uncle, me. You can see this is how this argument's playing out. And before all his house to appoint me ruler over the house of the people, the Lord of Israel, therefore I will play before the Lord. He's like, I'm right in what I did. You know what? And he, and he was. Again, what, David didn't do anything wrong in the story. It's everything David's done leading up to this that's made Mike Hall so upset. That's my opinion, okay? <clears throat> and, the, and then he says, and I will be yet more vile than thus. Oh, you didn't like that? This is a real good reaction, right? This, I'm sure this is going to help your marriage go great, okay? Oh, oh you didn't like that? Well, I'll, I'll be even more vile than thus. And I will be based in my own sight. I'm going to do things that I, I'm going to, I won't even be able to look in my own, in the mirror and be able to live myself. You don't like what I did today? I'm going to, I'm going to double down. And the maid servants which thou hast spoken of them shall I be had in honor. Now, whether or not he did or didn't, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell us. I mean, we know he had a lot of concubines and so on and so forth. But you know what? That's what he said to her. And it says there, therefore the Michael, uh, the daughter of Saul had no child unto the day of her death. And it wasn't because she was barren. That's not what it says. It says because they, at this moment, you know, everything leading up to it, and then it came to a head here, at this moment, they drove a wedge in between one another where they didn't even have that physical relationship anymore. They would just, you know, they were so bitter and angry and upset with one another that it ruined their marriage, okay? You know, and we could sit here and analyze it and say, well, is it, was, it even worth, was it even possible to save it at this point after everything had taken place? leading up to it. But you know what? You can't sit there and tell me that what David said here was right. You know, Michael probably had her reasons for, for doing what she did. But, you know, David kind of, you know, is, he kind of shows us what not to do. This is not how to handle the situation, folks. And this is a great principle that, you know, I always mention. There's what the Bible tells you to do, and then there's just what the Bible says what happened. You know, and I've, and look, I know people that have read that exact passage and used that as a justification to, to put their wife on the shelf. They, they, I, this story, this exact story. Their wife got envious about something. He said, so, you know, just like, just like David did. You know, I'm just not going to know her. I'm just not going to have anything to do with her from now on. Look, that's not biblical. That, that's just what the Bible says what happened. That's not a good example. This, don't look, this is not the passage you want to turn to for marriage advice, folks. This is the exact opposite of what you want to do. Go to Colossians chapter 3. We'll close there. Colossians chapter 3. Let me give you sound biblical marriage advice from the Bible today. Look, is it, is it possible that, that there might be wives and husbands, you know, wives uh, that have a bad marriage from time to time, that, or marriages go through rough patches, or maybe the husband does something and offends the wife, and she's envious, and she's upset, and she finally lets him know, maybe in a, in a very curt way or a very direct way, doesn't come to him and say, hey, you know what? I've got to tell you, you know, you upset me, you did this, you know, you wronged me. But maybe a wife just harbors this resentment, hangs onto it, and then just one day it all just comes boiling over, pours out. And then the husband, you know, he gets cut to the bone. And he says, well, I'm just going to fire back. And, you know, that could, that could ruin a whole relationship. Is it possible that kind of thing could happen? Sure. It could happen to the king of, Israel, uh, the king of Israel. It could happen to any one of us. So how should we handle that? How should we handle it, you know, and specifically to the husbands? You know, if we have offended wife, or even if we haven't offended them, maybe they've done something that offended us. You know, maybe they've done something that we didn't like, or they said something that we didn't like, and they've, and they've done something to make us upset. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. You know, she made me real mad, so I'm just going to, you know, I upset her. I made her real mad, so I'll just get her some flowers on, on Valentine's Day. You know, I'll just do something nice. I'm loving your wife. Is that what it means to love your wife? No, you do those things because you love your wife, right? You know, loving your wife is, is you know, it means you let things go. Look, if you love people, you let things slide. You let things go. You don't hold things over people's heads. That's why it says, husbands, love your wives, and what? And be not bitter against them. You know, we typically say it's women that get bitter. You know, that's typically a lot of preachers will get up and say, well, that's a, that's a sin that pertains unto women. Well, the Bible says it actually pertains unto men. 
You know, it pertains unto both, obviously, but, you know, it's something here, at least in this specific relationship of husband and wife, that seems to be a pitfall for men. The, the, the potential for, man, for a man is to get bitter at his wife. You know, kind of like David did. He said, oh, you didn't like, you know, she says something that upsets him, and he decides, well, I'm just going to double down on that. I'm going to fire right back, and, I'm, and rather than just letting it go, trying to rectify the situation, say, honey, what's wrong? Let's, you know, talk this out. What can I do differently? You know, how can I make this better? What do I need to do to change? He instead harbors resentment. And she has no child, the, you know, for the rest of, you know, that's it. That's the end of their relationship. It's over. You know, so that's the lesson we need to learn there. You know, David in this story, you know, Dave, when we, we first meet David, you know, as a shepherd boy and he gets anointed, there's a lot of great things that we learn about David. David's a good man. But as we progress through the book of 2 Samuel, we start to see that he is just that, a man. And that he has faults, he has shortcomings, just like all of us, right? And, you know, and thank God that, you know, that we have an example to look to, you know, of what to, of what to do, but also what not to do. Even when it comes to a relationship like marriage, we can look to King David, you know, and it'd be nice to say, well, this is what you should do. But actually, we look to him and we say, this is what not to do. And what should you do? Harbor resentment, harbor bitterness. But you know what's even better than that? is to not instill bitterness in the other person. You know, we should be careful not to do that, not, not to, to do and say things that are going to make our spouses upset with us because, you know, who can stand before envy? You know, so <clears throat> David, you know, he was wrong here to respond in kind. He did some things wrong when it came to his marriage relationship. He did some things wrong when it comes to serving God, right? That's the other thing we learned tonight. God wants things done a certain way. He's not interested in new. He's interested in his way, and that's it. And he has his reasons. And even if we don't understand him, we need to do it anyway, because that's what he said. That's what he's commanded. That's what we should strive to do as a church, as individuals, in our relationships, in every area of life. Learn to do things God's way. You know, and, and one of the things when it comes to marriage is to not be bitter, you know, and not to, and to, to be uh, upset and angry and, and hang on to things, but to let things go and to forgive and to love one another. Look, we're told to do that with, with people at church. We're told to do that with all, all of our relationships, to love one another and to forget who more so than our own spouse. I mean, you know, I'm going to see plenty of you guys, and you're going to see plenty of me week to week, you know, but you're going to see a whole lot more of your spouse than anybody else. You're going to spend a whole lot more time with them. You know, you want to be loving and kind at church. <clears throat> That's great. Make sure you take that home. You know, and do the same thing with your spouse at home because that's the person who's going to have more impact on your life than anybody else. Let's go ahead and pray.